runaway slave. I'm a runaway slave. I'm a runaway slave. I'm a runaway slave. I'm the one that got free. I escaped from the cage. Coming back when you sleep at your throat with the blade. I'm like Harriet with the 38 and a vertebrate. Ghetto gospel, apostle, knack, turn a face. RBG to the grave. I'm that spook by the door with the map to the maze. I'm Auntie Asada's getaway driver on a prison break. Spirit of the BLA, liberating banks, the glitch in the matrix. Slip out of my shackles, grab the whip and throw the captain off the slave ship. Rebel to enslavement, vow of the mile mile. Koopy tech, bullet cop, cut head, burn. I'm a runaway slave. 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 I got the blood of Kunta. Fighting for my freedom If I had to lose my life Then so be it So chop off my feet Chop off my hands Spin a roll up Out this bit If I can Man I'm sick of being held back Sick of being black Paul Why you think they label me A motherfucking outlaw Spirit too bright To be locked in a cage I release my rage When I'm rocking the stage Better yet Cocking the gauge Fleeing the plantation I do this for lost souls I'm drug cases. I'm burning up my papers and making a few changes. I'm dropping my slave name and rocking with my aliens. Young know the hope give hope to young strugglers. You one of us, runaway slaves. You should come with us. Know the hope give hope to young strugglers. You one of us, runaway slaves. You can come with us. I'm a runaway slave. I'm a runaway slave. I'm a runaway slave. I'm a runaway slave. I'm a runaway slave, 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 runaway slave. Run away, run away. Dr. Matulu, run away. Auntie Asada, Herma Bell, Sundiata. We salute you with the highest of honor. H. Rap Brown, Starry X, Aaron Patterson. Free all political prisoners, the prisoners of war. Free them all. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Greetings, greetings. Thank you so much for joining us. It looks like there's about 20 people watching. We appreciate y'all across the various platforms, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. We appreciate y'all for tuning in. This is Weekly Pan-African News. Good morning, Bird. Bird is our like most loyal viewer. <laughs> Good morning, comrade. Uh, but yes, this is Weekly Pan-African News presented to you by All African People's Revolutionary Party New Mexico. I am your very sleepy today host, Onya Sanu, and this is your second host who's a little bit more awake, Monica, and we are members of the All African People's Revolutionary Party, specifically the New Mexico chapter, the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Good morning, Mac, hood communist editor Mac. If you are interested in news from a revolutionary pan-African perspective, check out hoodcommunist.org. We got four new articles today, and they're dope. 
But this is weekly Pan African News presented by the All African People's Revolutionary Party. The All African People's Revolutionary Party is a revolutionary Pan African socialist party with the political objective of Pan Africanism, which we define as one unified socialist Africa. Today on the PE section of the show, we're going to talk about why that's the only way Africa is going to see liberation. The only way African people are going to see liberation. But we started the show back in March as a way to reach our folks during the pandemic. We understood that African people, because we are denied access to healthcare and resources, were at an extremely high risk of suffering terribly during this pandemic. We were extremely high risk of getting sick and not getting the help we need. And so we were like, we can't bring our folks together in person, but we still need to be able to talk to them. We still need to be able to like build with them. And so this show is one of many, many ways that the New Mexico chapter of the APIP came up with to continue to build with our people, to continue to reach our people. We've been doing it since March of 2020. It's going to be a year straight of this program next month. And we are very, very proud and also excited that y'all have been a long journey with us. So there are two things that we always do to open every single show. The first thing we always do is bring in an African ancestor. And the reason why we do that is because we understand as revolutionary African women, as members of a revolutionary African organization, that we are part of a continuum of struggle that began the very, very first moment. The very first European colonizer set foot on the shores of Africa. That was a Portuguese person. And that person got straight up murdered by indigenous African people who were like, who the hell are you? Why do you have weapons? Get the hell out of here. But we understand that we've been fighting for our liberation as African people for over five centuries. We are part of a continuum of struggle. This is not a new phase. This is the same fight to be free. And so that's why we bring in our ancestors because our ancestors laid the groundwork for us to be here speaking to y'all today. They sacrificed, they struggled, they built organizations, they built movements, and that is the only reason, the only reason that I'm able to be here speaking to y'all today, the only reason why I'm in this work today, because the people that did the work before I got here. So the ancestor that we wanna call in today is a man known as Sheikh Anta Diop. Sheikh Anta Diop. He is from Senegal, or he was from Senegal. He passed on February 7th, 1986. So the anniversary of his passing was this past Sunday. And who was he? Well, he was a prolific writer. He was the author of many scientific and historical works about African history, particularly African history before colonialism. You might have heard, um, you might believe based on imperialist and colonial propaganda that our history begins with slavery, but no, African history actually started thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. Africa is much, much, much older than the United States. So our history of African people is much, much, much older than the United States. But the narrative that imperialism spreads is that African history began with colonization. Not the case. So Sheikh Entadia, basing his theory on the kinship between African languages like Wolof, his mother tongue, because he was from Senegal, and ancient, ancient Egypt, uh, revealed the cultural influence of earlier African peoples on Egyptian civilization. And he demonstrated that ancient Egypt was, in fact, an African civilization. People, for some reason, debate the fact that ancient Egypt was an African civilization, but it clearly was. Sheikh Anta Diop proved that. W.B. Dubois proved that in the world in Africa. So Sheikh Anta Diop had degrees in chemistry as well as nuclear physics. In 1966, he created the first African laboratory for radiocarbon dating with a university that is now named after him in Senegal. As a student, he was an advocate for the independence of African countries that were suffering from colonialism and he later went on to become a major figure of the African Federalist Movement and presented his ideas in Black Africa, the economic and cultural foundations of a federated state. Some other books written by Sheikh Anta Diop, The African or uh, Origin of Civilization, in which he talks about how ancient Egypt uh, was an African civilization, um, civilization or barbarism, pre-colonial Black Africa, um, among many, many, many other works. So this was a prolific scholar who was also an active part of the struggle for Africa's liberation, who unearthed the true history of pre-colonial Africa, who proved that we had rich and uh, 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 complex and very advanced civilizations before Europeans um, even knew how to bathe on a regular basis. So we salute Sheikh Entadia. We bring him in as an ancestor. We are grateful for his work. Um, that is the ancestor we are bringing in on the show today. The second thing that we always do is we always want to acknowledge that we are on stolen land. We are speaking to y'all from Albuquerque, but Albuquerque is actually occupied Tijuana territory. The land we're on belongs to the Tijuana Nation. The Tijuana Nation is still here, and this is still their land. 
It doesn't matter how long ago something was stolen, it remains stolen until it's recovered by the rightful owners. And so the Tiwan Nation is the rightful owner of the land that Albuquerque was built on by colonizers and the entirety, the entirety of New Mexico, the entirety of the United States, all of Canada, all of the Western Hemisphere belongs to indigenous nations that are still here. Oopsie daisy. I like made you not see Monica, but you can probably still hear me. Hello. Hi. <laughs> But this, uh, na- uh, this land still belongs to indigenous nations of this hemisphere. Uh, we are going to fight for them to get it back, just as we are fighting for our land back in Africa. Palestine still belongs to Palestinians. Australia still belongs to indigenous Australians. That's why the shit was on fire, because the settlers don't know how to take care of the land they steal. And that's why all of Australia was on fire last spring, if people remember. Um, same thing, actually, that happens in California, because indigenous people know how to take care of this land, and European settlers do not, and that creates problems. This is still the land of indigenous people. Africa is still our land, and this land will be returned. Land was taken, land will be returned, land back. So that was the ancestor acknowledgement, followed by the land recognition. The third thing that we always do on the show is that we always have a political education segment. And the reason why we do that is because as ancestor Malcolm X said, you cannot organize a sleeping people. You must wake them up, and then you get some action. And so political education is how our contribution to waking up our people. We understand that in this decadent, backwards, uh, raggedy as hell capitalist society, we are told constant lies about our history, constant lies about who we are as people. And so political education is our way of introducing the truth, of introducing correct history, of introducing correct analysis based on that truth and history so that our people can be prepared to think critically about the nature of this place and more importantly, are prepared to move collectively to take this system down and build a better one in its place that is centered on life instead of profit. So that is why we do PE. And this is like a a strategy of the Elephant People's Revolutionary Party, no matter where we exist in the world. I said I was sleepy, but I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. (laughs) So let's see if I can keep it going. So the political education topic that we want to talk about today is Africa, imperialism, and propaganda. We want to talk about how imperialism lies about Africa and Africans on a constant basis across multiple platforms. They bald face lie about us and about our home. And they do that in order to facilitate the looting and exploitation of our land and the exploitation and oppression of us. So you want to unpack some of that law, so those imperialist lies, some of that imperialist propaganda, explain why they're doing that, explain the truth, and then finish with what we can do as African and colonized peoples to fight back. So first, let's talk about what imperialism is and what propaganda is. Uh, We had a whole episode of the show where we broke down in detail what imperialism is. I'm not going to go too deep into it. But what you basically need to understand is that imperialism is when a colonizer country decides they want to steal land, resources, and labor from a uh, poorer country or a colonized country. And so they go in there and they take their shit. And they facilitate all kinds of ways to make the taking of that shit happen. Sometimes it's by gaining control of their resources and straight up stealing them, like in the Congo. Sometimes it's by uh, giving them loans with super high interest rates that gives them control of the economy. Sometimes it's by overthrowing the leaders that that colonized nation wants and putting in place puppet leaders that will do what the imperialists say. It looks a lot, a lot of different ways, but the end result is that they get to steal shit that does not belong to them in order to build up the economies of the colonizer nation. That is what imperialism is. It's just stealing shit that does not belong to you at the root. And then in terms of what propaganda is, propaganda is just a way of spreading a particular narrative. Um, it's not necessarily negative. Like this show is the form of propaganda. This show is propaganda for revolutionary pan-Africanism or the revolutionary African liberation struggle. But unfortunately, imperialism and colonialism can use propaganda too. They can use propaganda to spread a particular narrative. We base our propaganda on facts, on history, on truth. Imperialism, however, bases its propaganda on lies and racism and white supremacy and patriarchy and all the isms that it created to divide and conquer colonized peoples. So propaganda on its, on its own is just using, as disseminating a particular narrative across multiple platforms. But it's not necessarily negative, but it can be based on truth or it can be based on lies. Our propaganda is based on truth. Imperialist propaganda, by necessity, because they want to use it to steal, is based on lies. So we're going to talk about some examples of what propaganda is and how propaganda from imperialism is used 
against Africa. And to start off the conversation, I'm going to pass it to Monica. Thank you, Anya Sabu. So I'm going to talk about um, some of the propaganda lies that are told. One is that Africa is poor. Since I was a kid, I remember like seeing those infomercials and commercials showing our people in poverty, showing drought, showing famine. And that's all I knew. So that's that, that's that propaganda. That's all I knew. That was my knowledge base of what Africa was and, and what it represented. And it was constantly, constantly instilled in us. It was on like every single channel, especially like if you grew up with no cable, it was on like me, it was on every single channel. And that was all that I knew of Africa. And then what we end up finding out and learning about once you're learning about the truth, right? And not the one-sided history that they teach us is African is the most rich land base on the planet. Literally the global economy um, has, excuse me, literally Africa, the stolen wealth, whether that's people, whether that's culture, whether that's um, items, whether that's riches has built the global economy, the global economy system as it is. And every European country, it literally stole everything. So examples of that, you might've seen uh, like oil, oil and shell gas companies that profit billions of dollars, like that oil is extracted out of Africa. Gold is extracted, uh, uranium, coffee, diamonds. Most people are familiar with the diamond mining and blood diamonds. I, I know a lot of people are familiar with that. But iron, tea, name it, it's been extracted and taken um, to um, build the global economic system. iPhones, if you got an iPhone, um, iPhones, um, uh, they profit anywhere to almost up to $30 billion annually. Well, the cobalt that gets iPhones to function is stolen, stolen and extracted from Africa. So there's this notion that Africa is poor but it's not. Africa has continued, whether it's people that it's extracted, like our, um, our, our ancestors, right, and building, and building um, this country, and also um, what happened even after slavery was ended, um, even though we know slavery still exists to this day. Um, our people had to also, in Africa, they also had to mine and not be paid. They also had to farm and not be paid. That is still forms of slavery. So um, Africa is not poor. It is so rich and thriving, but all the wealth is stolen. Britain has its hand in it. France has its hands in it. Portuguese has its hand in it. This uh, crappy raggedy country, US has its hand in it. Everybody is just stealing and ripping from our motherland, from our home, causing so much destruction, death, Poverty, so it's only impoverished because of imperialism, because of colonialism, because of the invaders in our homeland. Um, the other lie that we hear is our people, Africans don't know how to govern themselves, that um, uh, they have African government. And so um, why can't they govern themselves? Why, why, why are these things, why are the things keep happening? Um, oh, I just wanna go back to also, um, Oh no, no, I'm sorry. So um, they, that they can't govern themselves. So the challenges that our, our people face are rooted in, like I talked about colonialism, invasion. So the challenges that our people face, um, um, they don't control their own government. It's being controlled by so many different people. So for example, um, even with um, like, like I was talking about Africa's not poor, things are being stolen from them. In France, France literally since 1961, they have 14 African countries uh, reserves, their reserves money where they're like basically paying a tax in their own country to France. Like the, those people and those bodies are controlling how Africa operates. They can't control their own government. So even though you see people that look like us in power, it's a, it's a false perception of power. They are not in control at all. Um, for example, look at AFRICOM. And I've learned about AFRICOM because of AAPRP and Onya Sawu. Um, they have the most military bases now has been expanded because of Obama. It expanded under Obama and so much even more police representation in Africa throughout the diaspora. That is not controlled by them. That is being controlled by uh, US imperialism, right? Expanding in that area. 
They also uh, alienate our people from controlling and running their own government because they're under, um, they're under, our people are, are under control and saying what can happen, what could not happen. And even when we put our people in those spaces through community organizing, through grassroots organizing in Africa, they end up trying to eliminate them, whether they kill them, whether they remove them. And we've seen that constantly, like not just in Africa, but in other places. So Africa is not poor. It is one of the most richest land base on this planet. So remember that. Um, and also Africa, um, they, they don't govern their own country because they're being controlled by France and British and, and the US. That's who's running the government. Our people aren't running their own government because it allows them to continue this false narrative and it allows them to enslave our people. It allows them for us to not be connected to our land, our language, our culture, and our people. And it allows us to be disconnected and not see us as like um, all of our people, wherever our people are. Thanks, Monica. And as someone just pointed out in the comment, you mentioned that uh, the African countries that were colonized by France have to send a portion of their GDP to be stored in France's uh, national treasury. Like they have to send a portion of their own money to France for France to hold it. And France uses that money. But those same countries, the reason why that happens, because something someone thing pointed it out by someone in the comments, they were forced to sign at the point of decolonization this document called the Pact for Continuing Colonizations. That is the literal name of the document that France made them sign. And what that document does is ensure that France maintains economic and continual uh, political control of those African nations that are referred to as fr Francophone African countries. So France got fat as hell by colonizing Ooh. Africa and by continuing that colonization into the present day. It is not true that Africa is poor. Africa is rich. Africa is just being looted. It is being looted by France. It is being looted by Europe. It is being looted by the United States. Africa is not poor. Africa is the foundation of the entire global economic system of capitalism, like Monica just pointed out. Another, and they, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, and they only get to access sometimes only 15% of what's put in the, I didn't even know the name of it. So thank you for that. It's called PAC, what was it called again? The Pact for Continuing Colonization. That's ridiculous. So as Monica pointed out, um, the African nations are very often not allowed to actually govern themselves. This is true in Africa, this is true in the Caribbean, this is true in, tr true in Central and South America. Uh, they have the appearance of independence. They often have leaders that are African, but those leaders are not accountable to the mass of the people and the nations that they are leaders of. They're in fact accountable to imperialism and to colonialism. Um, a common narrative produced by that situation is that all African leaders are corrupt. At the reason why Africa is poor, so-called poor, the reason why Africa is suffering, the reason why Africa just can't get it together is because African leaders are somehow intrinsically corrupt. Something about them just makes them corrupt as, as opposed to like the external influence of imperialism. But that is not the case. Africa has had hundreds of revolutionary leaders, principled leaders, great leaders that were for the people, that were for Africa for Africans, that were for self-determination and independence for Africa and all African people worldwide. We have had many leaders that fit that definition that were not corrupt, that were principled and for the people. And what happened to those leaders? They were systematically overthrown and assassinated by imperialist powers. In the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, the United States, the UN and Europe conspired to assassinate dozens of revolutionary African leaders that had been in the front lines of anti-colonial struggles on the continent. People like Patrice Lumumba, the first democratically elected president of the Congo, a leader chosen by the masses of people in the Congo who said that Belgium would no longer be allowed to loot that country, that the Africans in the Congo be allowed to determine their own destiny, and he was going to help lead them towards liberation. Belgium and the U.S. heard that and they were like, no, thank you. And so they kidnapped him, murdered him, and dissolved his body in a barrel of acid. That is literally what happened. They kidnapped him, they murdered him, and they dissolved his body in a barrel of acid. And the reason why they did that is because they knew they could not use him as a puppet. 
they knew that he was going to be about Africa and the Congo first and that he could not be bought. And so rather than just letting the Congo live after looting it for like a hundred years and killing millions of African people, instead of just leaving the Congo the hell alone after they had won their independence, instead they murdered Patrice Lumumba and put in place a series of puppets they can control that allowed that country to be systematically looted, that allowed that country to fall into a failed state that it remains today, that allowed conditions of mass rape of African women and non-men and children, that allowed conditions of enslavement of African children. Like that is what's happening in the Congo right now. Monika mentioned that cobalt is used to produce the rechargeable batteries and in, in electronic devices like cell phones, the lithium ion batteries. That cobalt is found in mines in the Congo and is mined by enslaved African children, who oftentimes, because the mines are so dangerous, they have no safety protocols, because these multinational corporations that steal this resource don't care if the Africans there are like terribly injured. So the enslaved African children, sometimes as young as eight years old, are like losing their limbs and like dying, falling down and dying, breaking their legs and all that kind of shit, because they don't care. They just want, they just want the cobalt. So this is what they intentionally did to the Congo. They murdered Patrice Lumumba, they could continue looting it all the way to 2021. That's just one leader. Other examples, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana. Ghana was, of course, the first uh, 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 nation, African nation in West Africa to gain independence from European colonialism. Kwame Nkrumah was the first democratically elected president of that nation of Ghana after it gained independence. Kwame Nkrumah is also the founder of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Whoopsie daisy, why do I keep doing that? I keep uh, on a uh, hiding Monica and myself. Uh, so I should just stop clicking. <laughs> I do it when I'm nervous. Um, so yeah, Kwame Nkrumah was elected uh, the first democratically elected president of the first nation to gain independence in Africa. That nation was Ghana. Kwame Nkrumah was a socialist. He deployed a socialist vision for Ghana, where instead of Ghana's resources, like cocoa, like sea salt, like gold, being exported by uh, foreign corporations, instead they were kept within Ghana, and Ghanaian people were trained on how to produce goods from those resources. Usually what happens in Africa is that the raw materials are exported and they are manufactured into goods somewhere else. And then those goods are sent back into Ghana to be sold at really high prices. Um, that's what happened with rubber, for example, to make tires. Instead, Kwame Nkrumah was like, if we have rubber and we have people without jobs, why can't we put those people to work to make our own tires? Why won't we import tires if we already have rubber? He did the same thing with Cecil. He did the same thing with cocoa. He did it with gold too. He made Ghana, he worked to make Ghana self-sufficient and socialist. And in response, the U.S. was like, no, thank you. We do not want a self-sufficient African country. We do not want an African country that's been able to manufacture goods from its own raw materials. We do not want African people employed with health insurance and unions. No, thank you. And so the CIA conspired with sellouts within Ghana to overthrow Kwame Nkrumah's government overthrow the democratically elected government, the government that the African people in Ghana chose. The U.S. overthrew that shit. They said that Kwame Nkrumah was a dictator. They said he was oppressing his own people. All the things that you hear, all the things you typically hear about uh, leaders that are actually for their own people, he was a dictator, he's oppressing them. All this kind of shit they just made up. Overthrew his government, put in place a series of puppets of military dictators. And to this day, Ghana is a neocolonial state controlled by the West. Uh, as another African leader that was for about Africans, Africa for Africans, that was about building revolutionary pan-Africanism, that started a revolutionary pan-African organization that exists to this day, that provided material and political support for African liberation struggles all over the continent. And the U.S. overthrew that man and put in place puppets because they did not want Ghana to be free. So do not believe the lie that all African leaders are corrupt. No. The reason why the corrupt ones are in power is because imperialism wants them to be in power. If a non-corrupt African leader rises, they take them out. They kill them. They take them out of power. They overthrow them. This is what they do every time. Another example, another example, Mama Winnie Mandela of the African National Congress, a, a leader within the, the national liberation struggle in Azania. Azania is, of course, the African people's name for South Africa. Uh, she was uh, on the front lines of the armed struggle against apartheid and settler colonialism in Zania. Uh, she was one of the few leaders of the ANC 
that did not sell out, to be quite honest with you. To be quite honest with you. We don't have to go into it, but, but the ANC is in power right now and Azania is still not free. That's what you need to know about the ANC. But Mama Winnie Mandela was more militant. Mama Winnie Mandela was more principled. Mama Winnie Mandela was about the liberation of Africa, period. She understood that after the ANC came to power, Azania was still not free. And she refused to shut up about that. She refused. And in response, because of her role on the front lines of the armed struggle against settler colonialism, on the front lines of the armed struggle against apartheid, she was put on trial on a world stage. They tried to make this woman apologize for fighting to get her land back. They tried to make it seem like she was a monster, racist against Europeans, although she had been racist against Europeans. Like, could you really have blamed her? But they basically tried to demonize her, to assassinate her character in front of the entire motherfucking world in these like uh, truth and reconciliation proceedings in the Zania in which they tried to make it seem like the Africans that were fighting for their land back were somehow equally as wrong as the settlers that stole it by force. But despite the fact that they attempted to assassinate Winnie Mandela's character, despite the fact that they attempted to demonize her on a world stage uh, with some success in the West, like sometimes you talk to people in the United States and they're like, oh, Winnie Mandela was a monster. And I'm like, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. But despite all the work they did to try to destroy her character, she remained beloved by her people to her the day that she died. So do not believe it when people say that all African leaders are corrupt. Instead, when you hear that, remember that Africa had many generations of principled revolutionary leaders. Africa had heroes that fought for African people. And in almost every single case, the West worked to take power from those people and put in place these puppets. It is not African leaders that are corrupt. It is the leadership being imposed by imperialism upon Africa that is corrupt. There's nothing intrinsically corrupt about African leadership. It's the fact that we are not allowed to control our own governments, our own nations, that we are forced to deal with corrupt leadership by imperialism. That is the problem. There's no intrinsic corruption to African leaders. That's just racist. Anywho. Um, folks in the comments slang movement saying Nkrumahism is the highest stage of black power, correct? Pan-Africanism is the highest possible expression of black power. A united socialist Africa controlled by Africans would be the most powerful force for black power on the planet. That's why we're Pan-Africanists, y'all, because it is the highest possible stage of black power. Uh, folks saying long live Winnie. Folks naming Thomas Sankara, another principled revolutionary African leader that was overthrown by sellouts backed by the West. This happened over and over and over again. They systematically attacked every revolutionary African leader that Africa had. Emma Tal Cabral was showing on Saturday for the Pan-African film series. We're showing a documentary called Cabri Cabra Cabralista about the PIGC and about the ideology of Amical Cabral. Amical Cabral was, of course, the founder of the revolutionary organization in Guinea-Bissau that overthrew Portuguese colonialism. But Amical Cabral was assassinated before that struggle was won. He was assassinated by NATO forces uh, backing sellouts. So again and again and again and again, every time Africa has a true revolutionary leader, the West moves over time to take that person out. Take him out. So it's not a fact. It's not the case that all African leaders are corrupt. It's actually the case that imperialism opposes corrupt leaders on us by force. And whenever a non-corrupt leader rises, they attack that person with all of the force of their propaganda, all of the force of their militaries, and all of their force of their diplomacy. So, yeah. Maurice Bishop, Tatina Celia from the PIGC, over at Shirley Graham Dubois, W.B. Dubois' wife, all of these people systematically attacked by imperialism, systematically attacked. So no, it's not that African leaders are corrupt, it's that corrupt leadership is forced upon us by imperialists. Another lie that we, oh, sorry, pass it to Monica, because you are leading well, this part. Thank you, I appreciate that. I appreciate how all the names that are being dropped of, of our, our true leaders um, that have continuously um, been attacked, right? Um, I also think about how you said the highest form of power is uh, Pan-Africanism and liberation. And I appreciate that in this continued discussion and talk about reparations that are happening, the crumbs that they that reparations would actually do if it ever happened, but it's never gonna happen. So it's just like noise that politicians are making because the only form of reparations that we will accept is our land back, is our own controlled, um, our own controlled Africa. Um, again, our people, everything that came from Africa built this economy. So that's the only form of reparations that we'll take is liberation. 
Um, so also the other lie that hap the other lie that happens is um, kind of really connected to the poverty is that Africa needs charity from Europe and this country and NGOs do that right NGOs are always uh, raising money um, you see them in pictures and photos and videos in Africa and what's actually happening is like we talked about is looting like every European country is the biggest looters of them all they have looted everything left and right um, and uh, what happens with these NGOs when the NGOs are there, what it does is it undermines the struggle of our people being able to emancipate themselves. And um, it, it gives the perception uh, and it undermines what's actually really happening in Africa. And so what we're not thinking about is when we're seeing this poverty, um, um, this devastating poverty is the ability to um, see what our people are actually struggling with, to be able to see um, that they actually don't control anything and really work to emancipate themselves from the economic and political power that they have on them. And so that's what's really important is that <clears throat> we got to dispel that myth that these NGOs are there to save white saviors, um, our people in Africa, when um, the poverty that is there is only there because of the continued colonialism and imperialism that um, every European country has. So again, um, we have to uplift that fake propaganda that continually like um, is spread over and over. I'm so thankful that my son has never seen, if he's seen it, I, didn't, I wasn't with me to seen like those images of our people and those nonprofit organizations there uh, saving our people because that is not what's happening. Um, those and then I just think about the corruption of some of those nonprofits too that are there. How are you getting millions and millions of dollars for years and yet things haven't even changed changed there for our people? And again, it's just that false narrative that our people are poor. Um, they're only in poverty because uh, they just profit. They profit off of our suffering, and that's what they always have done. Um, pass it to Onya Sabu. Do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, like you just nailed it exactly. Like you nailed the issue. Like all of these charities are um, presenting themselves as a savior of Africa, saying like Africa just can't get it together. Africa's so desperately poor. These corrupt African leaders are 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 exploiting their own people without mentioning imperialism. But these charities often at times are getting hundreds of millions of dollars in donations, sometimes billions of dollars in donations with this false narrative in Africa that can't save itself. And so it must be saved by the West. And in exchange, all Africa is getting is soft power for imperialism. It's not actually getting help. Someone in the comments mentioned the American Red Cross, which is a very famous charitable organization, perhaps one of the most famous charitable organizations uh, in the United States. It is sold. It's one of those. It's it's definitely one of the, the entities that has like the, the big bellied starving African children commercial um, that's always talking about how it needs to fly around the world and like swoop in and save brown people. But if you actually look, if you actually look at what the Red Cross is accomplishing in these places that it's purporting to save, you find that it is taking hundreds of millions of dollars to do jack shit, like not a goddamn thing. For example, after the Haitian earthquake in 2010, Haiti was destroyed by that earthquake. And that's not because um, Haiti just doesn't know how to build a civilization. That's because Haiti has been systematically looted. That's an African nation in the Caribbean that has been systematically looted by imperialist and capitalist countries, by France, by the United States. It has been looted. And so for that reason, it's underdeveloped. And for that reason, it does not have the infrastructure to survive a natural disaster like that earthquake. So after the 2010 earthquake, Haiti was leveled almost to the ground. And then millions of people around the world in response donated to the American Red Cross because they wanted to help Haiti. And the American Red Cross, with that money, what do they do? It's not really clear. They didn't rebuild houses. They didn't provide clean water. They didn't rebuild any roads. They didn't actually help Haiti. They literally just took the money and used it to pay some petty bourgeois people's salaries. They got $500 million plus. Oh my God, why do I keep doing that? Hold on. Hold on. Yes, I was just looking it up. <laughs> yes, they went got $500 million plus, and they could not identify what the hell they actually did with that money. Because if you go and look at Haiti, Haiti is still more or less destroyed. Haiti has been exploited, devastated. 
the American Red Cross took hundreds of millions of dollars for Haiti, and the American Red Cross did jack shit, but just boost their own name. They even give money to the local organizations that exist there that were actually trying to help. They took that five hundred million dollars, and no one would know. No one could tell us what they did with it. We know ninety eight percent of the money goes to pay the what is it executives, pay their executives. The money didn't go to the people. The money didn't go to the community. I was just reading a, an article that says the Red Cross took in five hundred million dollars in donations from people around the world who wanted to help Haiti. And the Red Cross said it provided homes to 133,000 people, but folks that investigated could only find the Red Cross had built six, six permanent homes after getting $500 million. The Red Cross, they got $500 million. The Red Cross had claimed that they had provided homes to 130,000 people, which is like, even then, if they had actually done that, that doesn't cost $500 million. But then when people actually investigated what had been done, they only found six, six, like six, six permanent homes had been built after this fucking organization took five hundred million dollars. Five hundred million dollars. Get them locally, they do that. Like people's houses will burn down here locally in the United Snakes, and they'll give them three day voucher for a hotel. What is three days going to get you if your home just got burned down? Do not give to the Red Cross. They're trash. 100%. And that's just one example. This is the, that is like not an exception in terms of how NGOs engage with Africa and African nations. That is the rule. These organizations take hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars in funding and donations, and they don't do shit. All they do is spread imperialist propaganda and narratives, exploit the people of those nations. Someone pointed out in the comments that the Red Cross, uh, members of the Red Cross sexually assaulted a lot of patients with that money. Same thing with the UN mission in, in Haiti after the earthquake. The UN sent troops um, and the troops raped Haitian women. So this is what happens. These organizations take millions of dollars, they take funding, they go to these African nations and they just spread more exploitation and more imperialism. So do not believe the lie that Africa and African nations need charity because when you see what the charity actually looks like, it's just more looting and oppression in every case. Every and there were, were a lot of also African like athletes saying, give to Haiti or Af African artists, give, uh, give to Haiti through Red Cross, through Red Cross. And it's like, no, those are not charities to give to our people. Like there was things on the ground that they could have gave to, but they didn't. But because this country has, um, what is it called? Manipulated us. That was the first thing those uh, uh, celebrities were doing. They thought they were trying to help. I'm donating 10 million to Red Cross. Who will match me? I saw that left and right, left and right for Haiti. And all of us are like, no, don't give to there. 500 million, 500 million. And the people are still recovering. Someone said in the comments, Western NGOs giving charity to Africa is like me stealing money from your bank account every day and giving you pennies in return as charity. That is a very good comparison because like we already said, this entire global economic system of capitalism is built on a foundation of stolen African resources and exploited African labor. We built Europe. Europe is a pure creation of stolen African resources uh, and enslaved African labor, profit from enslaved African labor, labor that was forced to work on stolen indigenous land. Indigenous and African people built and stolen indigenous African resources built Europe. We built the United States. Y'all are not giving us charity. We are giving you charity. You would not exist without us. We don't actually need you. This is a parasitic relationship. It is a forced relationship of exploitation. There would be no Eiffel Tower, no Buckingham Palace, no White House, none of these first world glittering European cities. None of that shit would exist without resources stolen from Africa and African people and resources stolen from indigenous people. Point blank, period. So how are y'all gonna tell us after you built your civilizations by stealing from us that you are doing us a favor by sending in these fake ass charities to rape people and make more money off of us? It makes no sense. It makes no sense. When you actually study the history of how Europe became developed, if you actually study the history of how these places became global powers, you see they could not have done it without exploiting us. And so the idea they are coming to help us 
with these like bitch ass efforts that are actually looting from us and hurting us um is insulting on its face it's insulting on its face but imperialism spreads the lie imperialist propaganda spreads the lie that they are doing us a favor while they are picking our pockets it makes no sense Danny on the YouTube comments is saying, I believe the UN was also tied to the 2010 cholera outbreak in Haiti. The UN investigated, admitted a causal link, but denied any compensation. You are 100% correct. The UN so-called relief efforts in Haiti after the 2010 earthquake caused an outbreak of cholera. The UN admitted this. And then they were like, damn, that sucks. Peace. And also, that was the same UN mission that I mentioned earlier, where those UN workers were raping African women in Haiti and were raping African children, like girls as young as 12 years old were raped by UN officials. This is widely known. There was never any kind of accountability. They spread disease and rape. And they said they were doing that to help Haiti, because that is what Western charity looks like. So another lie uh, that is frequently spread about Africa by imperialism is the idea that Africa is just full of ethnic conflict, ethnic tensions, that Africans are always just fighting on the basis of ethnic identity. Uh, this has been the permanent state of Africa. Uh, there's nothing anything anyone can do about it. That's just how it is because we're so uncivilized. There's constant ethnic clashes, clash, clash, clash. The reality of the situation is that those conflicts are deliberately instigated by imperialism. They are deliberately stoked. They are deliberately spread by imperialism because as far back as the very first moment that european colonizers came to africa they have used the strategy of divide and conquer to ensure their access to our resources and land and labor they spread they initiate these conflicts between ethnic groups in africa they stoke the flames they arm one side they demonize the other side and then they let us motherfucking fight while they steal from all of us that is the actual source of ethnic conflict in Africa. We already mentioned at the top of the show, the ancestor we called in was Sheikh Anta Diop that did deep, intensive studies of pre-colonial Africa. We mentioned The World in Africa by W.B. Du Bois that we're actually reading a work study right now where he talks about the history of pre-colonial Africa. And if you study the work of scholars like Du Bois and Diop who, who analyze pre-colonial African history, you find that African nations, regardless of ethnicity, were living in peace for thousands of years before European colonizers came. Certainly there was like, you know, struggle for like land and resources, like there always was anywhere, but it wasn't a situation where people were like genociding each other. It wasn't a situation where it was like constant ongoing acrimonious conflict with one side being dehumanized while the other side like wiped them out. That was not the case for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. African nations of all kinds of ethnicities, all kinds of political and religious beliefs were able to live side by side, engage in trade, engage in cultural transfer with no issues whatsoever. For the majority of Africa's history, the kind of ethnic conflict that we see in the 20th century, the 21st century did not exist. It didn't exist. It didn't exist. So this idea that ethnic conflicts are just like a, are just a fact of African existence is a lie created by imperialism. At the 1884 Berlin Conference, where European powers, they literally sat at the table together and they divided Africa up. There were no Africans in the room at the Berlin Conference. It was all European powers being like, let's split up. They called it like a rich African cake. Let's split up this cake. You take this part of Africa. We'll take this part of Africa. You get that part of Africa. You get that part of Africa. And then they form the African nations that exist now. The African nations that exist in 2021 were created by imperialist powers. And they created those nations. Sometimes the border would like split an existing nation in half. Sometimes it would like slam people together who weren't getting along. They didn't care who was actually on that land. They cared about giving themselves access to resources and splitting them up amongst themselves. And so the borders created by the Berlin Conference split up existing nations, splashed other nations together, and created the conditions that produce the ongoing so-called ethnic tensions that exist to this day. They did that shit intentionally, intentionally. And then they went into nation after nation after nation, and they deliberately stoked the fires of ethnic conflict. For example, last year in 2020, if folks remember, Sudan had a whole ass revolution. They overthrew a dictator that had been put in place by Western powers that had been oppressing them. 
And the thing to know about that dictator is that he remained in power because the West deliberately went in and created conflict between, between Africans of Arab descent and Africans who were black like us. They intentionally worked to create separation between those people who previously had been living completely fine next to each other for thousands of years. Thousands of years, they were fine. But instead, they went in and they said, the Ar hey, Arabs, you're better than the Africans. Hey, Africans, you're better than the Arabs. Fight, fight, fight. And they used the conflict they created between those two ethnic groups in the Sudan to keep this dictator in place. And the reason why the Sudanese revolution was successful in overthrowing him is because the people of Sudan, regardless of their ethnicity, were like, we need to come together. This man is fucking us all over. They're deliberately trying to make us fight so that he stays in power. So let's come together and push them out together. And that is what they did. That is what they did. That is what happened in the Sudanese revolution. So what does that show you? It shows you that when Africans decide that our uh, uh, objective for liberation is greater than the differences between us, that we can come together and take power, or at least push out the people that are oppressing us. It's only because European powers intentionally come in and stoke the fires of these conflicts that we are not able to resolve them. Imagine if you were like in a fight with your friend and you were surrounded by people that were kept instigating. You were trying to make up and people were like, you hear what she said? You hear what she said about you? Like you were all constantly trying to make up and someone was trying to tell you to keep fighting. Like that is the situation in Africa. That is the situation we are forced to find ourselves in. So it's just, this narrative is that Africa has like these intractable ethnic conflicts and this is always how it's been, that African people are so barbaric that we're gonna fight each other about like tribal differences or religious differences or cultural differences. That is not the case, man. That's not the case. For the majority of Africa's history, ethnic groups, Different religions, different cultural practices live side by side in harmony. We traded with each other, we would chill with each other until colonizers came, decided they wanted to steal our shit, and figured out that divide and conquer was the most effective way to do that. So do not believe the lie that ethnic conflicts are just a part of Africa, that just, that's just how it's gotta be. Um, that is a situation that was deliberately created. It was deliberately created. And to be honest with you, if you, Look at the condition of even African people in the United States. You can see them doing the very same thing. The antipathy that exists between Africans born in the United States and African immigrants was created, was intentionally cultivated by our colonizers to keep us separated, to keep us separated. Even uh, tensions within the same neighborhood where someone's like, you're from this side, I'm from this side, we can't get along. That shit was intentionally created. They do that shit to us all around the world, not just in Africa. That is not the natural state of African people. We actually get along when we're left by ourselves. It's the outside influence that forces us to fight amongst ourselves. This is what they are doing and they are doing it intentionally. Ethnic conflict is not a necessary part of African culture and African present. Ethnic conflicts are intentionally stoked by imperialism. And then they spread this narrative, well, this is how Africans are in order to continue to do it without any consequences. Um, what are y'all saying? Let me see, let me see. Uh, Teresa, who is a comrade in APRP, good morning, comrade, says true reparations would bankrupt the entire Western world as they should. I agree. I agree. If the West, if the United States, if Europe were actually to pay what is owed to Africa for what has been done to Africa to this day, they would go out of existence. Their economies would collapse. People talk about trillions of dollars are due. Y'all have no idea. It is more than the entire GDP of all these places combined that is owed to us. They don't even have the capacity to pay what it's owed because it's so much. So Teresa, Teresa is absolutely correct. Martin says that that corny, we are the world song is the perfect example of propaganda. It pushes the image of African poverty without touching on the root causes. 100% correct, 100% correct. That's the reason why they do that like poverty porn, the tragedy porn, where it's like a, a starving African child with a big belly covered in flies. And they're like, look at how sad it is. Send us money. They never show you why that African child is starving. They never show you why these nations are underdeveloped. They only show you the end result without illuminating the role that they play in creating those conditions. So absolutely, we are the world in the perfect example of imperialist propaganda. Christian says, how Europe underdeveloped Africa by Walter Rodney really opened my eyes to imperialist propaganda. Yes, highly recommend that book. Again, the title is How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, and the uh, author is Walter Rodney. And it is a comprehensive study of what we are laying out in this show, that Europe is a pure creation of stolen African labor, resources, and stolen indigenous land. They built that shit by stealing from us, and Walter Rodney breaks it down 
systematically and scientifically. He starts from just before the transatlantic slave trade through the 60s. And he shows you, he shows you how Europe built itself up by stealing from us. Highly recommend that book. Actually, if you Google it, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa by Walter Rodney, you can actually find a PDF of the whole thing for free. So please check it out. It also has a really good chapter on slavery where he says, like he breaks down why the idea, the propaganda spread by imperialism that Africans sold us and Africans like, you know, were as complicit in the slave trade as Europeans. He breaks down why that's a bunch of bullshit. He breaks it down all the way. Certainly Africans were selling Africans during the slave trade, but that was a minority of people. And also they were forced into that situation for the most part. He breaks it down. He breaks it down. He gives you the perfect ammunition you need to counter any kind of racist ass argument about African people being as complicit in slavery as Europeans. What else are y'all saying? Um, Hillary Clinton benefited from, invested in the Hutu Tutsi genocide. Correct, that is another ethnic conflict in Rwanda that was intentionally created uh, and then exacerbated by imperialist powers. People, that's like an example of, a, of a, an ethnic conflict that people point to as an example of why Pan-Africanism is not possible, as an example of why Africans can't, can't get along, but it was intentionally created and the fires of it stoked by imperialist powers, including the United States, including Belgium. What are you saying? Mali was split into five pieces. Sudan was a psyop. Onya, you'd be giving history. Thank you. Um, let me see what else, what else, what else. African leaders are often handpicked by Western governments. People like Jax Foucault, oops, and others who are the reason why we have a hijo in power in Cameroon, and Bago in Gabon to this day. They took out the revolutionary Pan-Africanist UPC in Cameroon, put in neocolonial puppets, and now the country is divided over colonial languages. Totally fabricated. Absolutely. Thank y'all so much. Y'all are dropping facts in these comments. Um, Slaying Movement says Pat Robertson was one of the main ones to profit off of this. Pat Robertson was sending airplanes with mineral equipment to Liberia to build wealth. You recognize the name Pat Robertson, huh? Yeah, that guy's trash. Right? And Hillary Clinton is going to hell for sure. Yes, Mac. Yes, she is. If I could meet Hillary Clinton in person, I would fight her. I would just fight her. Because that woman is evil. That woman has systematically destroyed and personally profit off of uh, exploitation of African countries, has deliberately spread imperialist propaganda. She is a monster. She is a monster. And when t in 2016, when, when she would run against Trump, if people were tell trying to tell me she was lesser evil, I was like, you don't know who she is. You do not know who that woman is because she is responsible for what is the situation in Libya. She is responsible for the situation in Haiti, or she could she like literally like use Haiti as like a plantation to like enrich herself. She is responsible for the overthrow of the democratic government, democratically elected government of Honduras, where my family is from. She put a dick help put a dictator in power there. Hillary Clinton has been around all around the African world fucking with us. And people try to tell me she was a lesser evil. Y'all can go to hell. Anyway, so we broke down some of the lies that are told by imperialism about Africa. The lie that Africa is poor. The lie that Africans can't govern ourselves. The lie that all African leaders are corrupt. The lie that Africa need, need, needs charity from Europe and the U.S. The lie that ethnic conflict is just a part of Africa. All of those things are lies deliberately spread by imperialism in order to facilitate looting our home. So... We broke down the lies, we gave you some truth. So what do we do about this? Well, the way that we combat imperialist propaganda, the way that we combat imperialism, colonialism in Africa and all over the African world is by building Pan-Africanism, by unifying the diaspora and the continent around the political objective of Pan-Africanism, which again is one unified socialist Africa. The reality situation is that imperialist powers, these colonizers are not going to stop doing this shit. They're not gonna stop lying about, uh, about us and our home. They're not gonna stop looting Africa. They need to steal from Africa in order to enrich themselves, in order to keep their civilizations going. So they're not going to stop on their own. They're just not going to stop, which means we as African people around the world must join organizations fighting for the political objective of Pan-Africanism, fighting for the political objective of one unified socialist Africa, which would mean Africa and Africa's resources and Africa's wealth under the democratic and collective control of the masses of African people. That is the only way the only way that these imperialist powers are going to stop looting Africa. That's the only way that they're going to be leave us alone. That's the only way. We must, we must build a unified socialist Africa. A unified socialist Africa would be a superpower, a global superpower. If Africans had collective control of African resources and wealth, we could use that resources and wealth to make sure that our people had healthcare, had housing, had education, had safety, 
no matter where we exist in the world. And if we had tried to control those resources, capitalism could not use it to enrich these empires. These empires would be disempowered. A unified socialist Africa would be a death blow for global capitalism and imperialism. They need Africa to be superpowers. They need to steal from Africa in order to enrich themselves, in order to control the world. If we take Africa from them, they are going to collapse. Monique, would you add anything? The only thing that I would add is that we have the ability to do this. Like we have been told so much that we don't, but if we can continue the work of our ancestors, building and organizing together, um, we have the ability to collapse their system that oppress, that harm us. Like we don't have anything to lose because it's killing us. It's killing our people everywhere. No matter where ever Africans are, they are oppressed. Name a place where Africans are, our people are oppressed, exploited, name it. And so we have, we, we, we either live or we die. And so capitalism is gonna to continue to kill us. So we have to do this, we have to organize. That was the PE section. That was like, we're right at the hour. So we're going to keep it moving. But thank you all so much for your comments and for your engagement and for hearing us out about these lies that imperialism stays telling about our home. We appreciate y'all. As Lang and Monika just said, we have nothing to lose. We must build revolutionary pan-Africanism before capitalism takes us the hell out. Because that's the trajectory, man. We are seeing, we are living through it. Like they are letting us die during a global pandemic because they don't give a fuck if we exist or not. They just need like enough of us to keep the machine going and the rest of us are disposable. Disposable. So we already know the trajectory that we are on if capitalism continues is death. Is death for the masses of African people, death for poor and working class people and colonized people. So we say that we choose life and we say that we're gonna choose to build pan-Africanism. Next part of the show, we wanna talk a little bit about what's happening here in New Mexico with COVID. Uh, speaking of capitalism letting us die, Monica, tell, uh, tell the folks what's going on. Yeah, it is like a microscope. If you didn't know that they didn't care about you and they wanted you to die, the pandemic revealed it. So people were like, open up, open up. And there are there are places, if you see a lot of the places that are open, it has a lot of majority of our people that are there. So they do not care if half a million people have already died. It doesn't matter if 3 million people die because billionaires have made trillions during this pandemic. So even if three or 4 million of us die, it doesn't matter to them because they're still profiting, right? And so what they're trying to do now is, um, you know, it's really different. What's interesting to me, it's people see it different when Trump says open up schools versus Biden says open up schools. I don't understand, it's the same thing. Opening up schools is dangerous no matter what. When you're in a pandemic with the virus, that's viral. And we have here in New Mexico, what the, our governor announced, uh, or the governor, I should say, announced uh, to um, open, have a plan to open up schools. So now school districts are forced with the decision to open up schools. We know like Las Vegas, New Mexico, they decided not to open up schools, thank goodness. And we have Las Lunas who decided to open up schools. Albuquerque Public Schools had a six hour meeting and they will be meeting again uh, next week to decide this. And we uh, wanna share just some statistics. We know in New Mexico, um, there's been over, there's been over 3,400 deaths from coronavirus. Also in our prisons, uh, people who are behind the walls are four times seven, 4.7 times more likely to get coronavirus. And there's been 26 deaths in the prison system, prison industrial complex here in New Mexico. And so what's happening is vaccinations are happening. So we there are healthcare staff, uh, educators are now um, the priority to get vaccinated, but not people behind the walls when they have a higher chance of getting coronavirus and dying. So again, it's all about the economy. Um, and so people can get vaccinated. So healthcare workers, educators, no matter what, if you decide to get vaccinated, you can get vaccinated and you can still get coronavirus and transmit it. The idea of the vaccine does not make you immune. The idea of the vaccine is it um, helps to fight off coronavirus and you have milder symptoms. And so if teachers and educators and staff all have the vaccine and children under 16 don't and coronavirus can still be spread, do you all see where I'm going here? 
we can have more coronavirus being spread to the homes of um, the teachers and families, as well as the students and families. And we also know that children who um, are uh, come from colonized impoverished communities have a 75% more chance of dying for, uh, they're, they're, they account for, excuse me, they account for 75% of the deaths, overall deaths in children. So that's our kids. That's our kids in New Mexico. That's our kids in Albuquerque. Um, also, what it would be in the school system is it would be 25 days of online in-person learning. So they would still be doing online, online learning in person at schools. It would be literally the schools, the teachers are saying would be set up like a prison system. Um, and so why do we wanna send our children to those spaces where they're just wanting to sacrifice the lives of children, sacrifice the lives of teachers? It's really, it's too dangerous, we shouldn't open and no one's gonna take responsibility um, for that loss of life. And so it's not a public health decision that's happening. They want to send people back to work. And it makes no sense to me because if you send people back to work, the children are only going to school for two days. The other two days, they're still at home learning. And then the other day, they wouldn't be. So it's 25 days. Is it worth loss of, um, loss of life? It's not. And so make sure that you are doing everything that you can to organize your community to talk about what you feel are is most important about the safety and well-being of our children, of our teachers, of our families, of our community members. I don't know if you want to add anything on yourself to that. No, you nailed it. I was like, bam. And in our closing, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, Onya Sabu dropped so much knowledge. People drop knowledge in the comments. I also now have another book to read um, that I, I already uh, saved on my computer so I can read and learn more about how, um, of course, our Africa was stripped of resources and built Europe. So I look forward to reading that book. Thank you for so much for sharing that resource. This weekend, you can join every Sunday at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Ajamo and Shakura will be doing a show this weekend. It's on reparations, Africa, Africa, the creation and liberation. Um, Pan-African Film Series, APRP New Mexico chapter, we hosted every second Saturday of the month. Join us at 2 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. We're going to be showing Capitalista. It's going to be about uprising and organizing in Guinea-Bissau. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be good. Tune in every week, uh, every Thursday at 12 p.m. to watch Pan-African Weekly News. We might be doing our, we saved ourselves next week or the week after. You don't want to miss that. So watch our page because we'll be posting what we're going to do next show. Join an organization. Join an organization. There are uh, many organizations you can join. The only way we can get make change and um, um, we can't vote our way to liberation. Um, we can't uh, nonprofit our way to liberation. We can't um, buy black to liberation. The only way that we can get to the liberation is if we join an organization to dismantle these systems and take back what is ours. Join an organization. If you are in New Mexico, you can join the AAPRP chapter. We need you. We need our people to be with us, to organize, because we want to build better communities um, for our people. Um, uh, and where if you um, are not in New Mexico and you want to join APRP, there are chapters all over the world. And so you can reach out to us and we connect you to a chapter. Thank you all so much for joining us. Stay ready for the revolution, y'all.